Welcome. Today we're going to be talking once again about the flow state. Now this is episode two in the Finding Flow series uh, and you can check the description, the description and watch episode one first if you haven't already. Uh, today we're going to talk a little more about the specifics of the flow state and then my cousin Will is going to come in and we're going to talk about flow in games, specifically video games. So with that said, let's crack into it. All right, so last time I talked about how flow is basically a product of engagement uh, with an activity or task. It involves consciousness being well ordered. It's intrinsically rewarding as an experience. And it's basically a product of being present to the moment with whatever task you're doing at that particular time. Yes, there is usually some kind of goal that is being uh, worked towards, but you are not so fixated on the goal that you miss the enjoyment of the moment. Now, today we're going to go into a bit more detail about how flow experiences fit into the broader picture of experiences in general. So here is a diagram for you. So as you can see here, the kind of experience that you have when doing certain activities can be understood as being determined by how your skill or ability level matches up against how challenging or complex the activity is. So flow is produced when the challenge level is high, but your ability level is also high. So obvious example would be uh, a ballerina who's very skilled, performing a very complex series of movements. Yes, it's difficult, but she doesn't feel, say, anxious because she knows she can perform those tasks well. Uh, if, if her skill level was low, she would feel a sense of anxiety. On the other side of the spectrum for, uh, to anxiety, you've got relaxation. Uh, this is basically produced when the skill level is high, but the challenge level is low. Right. This is just one way of understanding relaxation. It's a word which uh, could be understood in many different ways. But the way I, I understand it with respect to this diagram is that effectively it involves the creation or completion of something that is still kind of in some sense worthwhile, but the person doesn't have to focus too much in order for that to be created, right? So this could, an example of this would be guitar improvisation for someone who's been playing for decades. Let's think of an amazing guitarist like, um, I don't know, Steve Vai. Uh, they're able to relax whilst improvising because the challenge level is low. All they have to do is just play. There's not, it's not a strict criteria for success, uh, but their skill level is high. If they were attempting to play a really difficult set piece, then they would probably get into a flow state because the challenge level would be, would be high, but the skill level would also be high. Now, something important to note here is that how challenging an activity is, is set by how you define success or what your criteria for success are with respect to the activity. So what this means is that you can take an activity that seems very easy, and if you place constraints on it uh, as to what counts as completing it successfully, it can actually become a lot more challenging and therefore an opportunity for flow to emerge. So in the book flow, I haven't got the book on me right now, I was, I was planning to hold it up at that point, uh, there is a case study uh, of a factory worker who performs a repetitive job uh, on the factory line. Now he basically tried to optimise and uh, continually beat his record for performing the tasks on the factory line and thereby actually came to enjoy his job despite the fact it was very repetitive and the fact that most people wouldn't have seen it as something which could even be enjoyed right so he was just building um, I think some some kind of device or something and his he set his criteria for success to be it has to be performed within this time limit and it has to be done this elegantly and um, very smoothly and efficiently and so because he set the challenge level high he was able to develop a higher level of skill and get into the flow state now clearly although there are lots of 
these kinds of opportunities for turning relatively simple tasks into uh, complex challenges, flow is more easily found in more obviously challenging tasks where you don't have to create these um, kind of constraints or conditions, right? So for example, hashing out an important business deal or playing a virtuoso piece on uh, the piano or any instrument really. Uh, these, these are more obvious ways to get into flow. And many kinds of skill are built by setting a challenging but not unobtainable goal, engaging in the task fully to the best of your ability such that a flow state is achieved, uh, working until the goal is achieved, and then basically repeating this practice process on a regular basis such that your skill increases, you uh, get into a flow state frequently because you are being stretched. The skill is going up, but the challenges are going up and you just go deeper and deeper into the flow state experience. So now we're gonna talk, I'm gonna segue into the second half of this video by just briefly talking about flow in games. Now, those of you that have studied philosophy will know that game, uh, a game is notoriously difficult to define, right? Wittgenstein talks about it and you could have a whole separate video or even a book or course on, on, on that, right? But one way we could look at games is as activities with clear rules in which there is some kind of goal or goals that need to be completed and the purpose is that you enjoy enjoy the process, right? You wouldn't play a game if you didn't if if you knew that you could not enjoy it normally. Now these could be competitive, uh, so such as football, you've got two sides facing against each other, or they could be played by just one person. Uh, for example, solitaire. And games of all kinds provide great opportunities, I think, to get into flow states. Uh, and now we're going to bring in my cousin Will to talk about how flow is an important feature of video games and why playing video games can uh, benefit your life for a number of reasons. Let's go. Right, so I'm here with Will. And uh, first question I have for you is basically, how does flow relate to video games? And uh, yeah, can you just tell me a bit about that in general? Um, flow is pretty important to game design. It's actually the most crucial part of immersion, which is generally what any game designer strives for. And it's actually so important that a lot of current research into flow is actually funded by game companies such as you know EA and Activision and Valve and people like that. But other factors, they're, they're also important to immersion, you know, strong visual design, for instance, strong sound design, um, and these also increase the immersion in their own ways and the flow by extension. A good game will generally use every aspect of the game to communicate to the player. It'll use environmental design, character design, sound design. It might seem simpler to just explain to the player, like, this is what's going on. But if they don't get the chance to actually figure it out for themselves, then they don't really, there's a lack of engagement there. And that's really what makes good gameplay. And that's where flow comes into it. Cool. Okay. Uh, and second question is, just in general then, why can playing games be of uh, benefit to a person and uh, help them to grow as an individual? Um, well, it's generally been proven in a lot of studies, uh, there's some links in the description, um, that games can increase cognition, perception, focus, as well as decreasing reaction times. It's been shown that these skills build up faster in a flow state, as shown in the book um, Flow by the guy, <laughs> Mihaly, his name. Um, and these skills generally build up faster in a well-designed game. Hmm, okay, so do you think that using um, the tenets of game design can then improve your own life? Like you could kind of almost look at life like a game designer, perhaps. People are a product of their environment, but they also control their environment, and that control can induce high productivity. Just as a game designer will control each aspect of a game to reinforce its central themes, you can also control aspects of your life that induce better habits in subconscious ways. So for example, you can use subtle communication to constantly keep your goals in mind. You can keep reminders in areas that you constantly see all the time, uh, so like the bathroom mirror, on your computer monitor, things like that. And these help to keep you in a flow state because the reminders keep you focused on what you want to achieve. You can also remove distractions as much as possible by creating a specific area dedicated to working towards your goals in which there are no distractions. And when you have complete control over this area, then you can keep yourself in the right mindset to achieve your goals. A well-designed game keeps you immersed and interested in the task at hand, and likewise a well-designed life does the same. Cool, um, thank you Will for your input and I uh, hope you enjoyed the video and find it useful in some regard uh, and 
I will see you next time. Thank you. Peace.